to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. Welcome to our study of the book of Revelation. Revelation is probably one of the more discussed in people's minds, one of the more interesting books in all the Bible, and yet at the same time, it is one of the misused and abused books, one of the most misused and abused books in all of Scripture. People come to the book of Revelation with ideas and fairy tales that God never intended for Revelation to be about. Revelation has often become a launching pad for these types of stories. People have found the wars in the past or things that are going to supposedly happen in the future. People have even come to the book of Revelation and found such things as submarines and airplanes, the invention of those. Friend, that's not what God intended the book of Revelation to be about. The book of Revelation has also been abused in the sense that it has become a fertile ground for many false prophecies. Whether those prophecies are things that people look back on in history and say, well, see here, the book of Revelation prophesied about that, or whether they are future events. For example, a recent advertisement promoted this. If you'd like to find out about Armageddon and Nostradamus and his prophecies concerning the years 2009 through 2012, look here. And friends, I guarantee you they're going to try to point you to the book of Revelation and combine that with supposedly what Nostradamus said to prove some kind of prophecy. These were not the purpose of the book of Revelation in the first century, and they are surely not its application for us. God gave the book of Revelation to first century Christians who were suffering greatly as an encouragement to keep hanging in there, to never give up, and in the end, if you do so, you will be victorious. Placing the book of Revelation in its proper category in the New Testament helps us to understand its place a little better and its purpose. For example, Matthew through John, the gospel accounts were written to tell us about the life of Christ, who He is, how He lived, and how He died for each one of us. The book of Acts is the second category in the New Testament, and it tells us how to become a Christian. So once I learn about Jesus, Acts then tells me how to become a member of the body of Christ how to become a follower of Christ. Romans through Jude, the third category in the New Testament, tell us on a daily level how to live for Jesus and what God expects of me now that I am a Christian, a member of the body of Christ. And then Revelation, that, that grand ending to the New Testament, tells us how to die faithfully as the child of God. I learn about Jesus. I learn how to become a Christian. I learn how to live and I learn how to die faithfully as a member of the Lord's body. In this lesson, we're not going to be looking at a detailed account of every image or going chapter by chapter and giving a full understanding of every image or every item. Rather, we're going to try to do two very basic things. We want to offer some helps, some keys that will help the individual Bible student to go to the book of Revelation and understand what some of the main images, what some of the main ideas are. And secondly, we want to show that this book book is a very practical book, that Revelation doesn't have to be a mystery. I have heard Bible students, members of the Lord's Church say, you know, I don't like studying the book of Revelation, and really, I don't think it ought to be in the Bible. Friends, such type of language is at the very least irreverent and on the verge of being blasphemous to the Scripture. And so we need to understand that this is a book that I can understand, and it's a book that applies to me on a very practical level. Let's begin with some basic helps, some key ideas, some key things in the book of Revelation. For example, 
The Bible says in the book of Revelation that this is a book that can and must be understood. I want you to notice Revelation 1 verse 3. From the outset, God says we can and must understand this book. The scripture says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep the things which are written in it, for the time is near. God says blessed, and the idea of blessed is divine happiness. Uh, divine benefits are placed upon the person who reads and understands and keeps the things written in this book. Why? Because for first century Christians, the time wasn't very far off. Friend, the same principle by application occurs to us today. If I want to receive the divine blessing of God on how to deal with, how to overcome, how to face tribulation in my life, I need to read and I need to understand the book of Revelation. And so God is not trying to confuse us. God did not give us the book of Revelation so it could pique our interest or give us some launching pad to things God never intended for it to be. It is a book when kept in context that can be read and understood and friends it promises a divine blessing to each one of us when we do. You know throughout scripture there are blessings that are placed upon reading the Bible. Matthew 5 verse 6 Jesus says blessed or happy is the one who hungers and thirsts for righteousness. The psalmist showed us the benefit of following God's word and dealing with sin. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. The psalmist says your word I've hidden in my heart then I might not sin against you. I understand that if I read the Bible, I can keep myself from sin. I understand that if I hunger and thirst after righteousness, I will be filled. God's Word is like a lamp to our feet and a light to our fat path. Look at that blessing. Psalm 119, 105. And friend, just like these passages, which all of us understand, we're going to find a divine blessing when we come to the book of Revelation with the mindset that I can read and I can understand what this book is all about. Now, to help in understanding the book of Revelation, we also need to understand what some of the key ideas and especially some of the key verses are. I think Revelation 11 and verse 15 is a good summary statement of what the book of Revelation is all about. Notice what this text says. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15, God says this, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. How does that sum up the message of Revelation? Christians were living during the time of the Roman rule, Roman Empire. It was a very wicked, very ungodly empire. They were not favorable toward Christianity. In fact, they were trying to stomp it out. And God tells Christians throughout the book of Revelation, if you hang on, if you don't give up, if you remain faithful unto death, Revelation 2 verse 10, you can be assured that Christ and His kingdom What's the kingdom of Christ? The church, Matthew 16, verse 19. The church in the end is going to be victorious over all world governments. If we remain faithful to the church, no matter what happens, even if we lose our life, we're still going to be victorious. That's the key idea in the book of Revelation. Don't let any government, don't let any ideology change you. You stay true to God and His kingdom no matter what, and you'll be the winner in the end. You see, my friends, we need to understand that God still rules in the kingdoms of men. Daniel chapter 4, verses 25 and 26. Now, the key word in the book of Revelation is the word overcome. This word is used about 17 times in the book of Revelation. For example, Revelation 3, to the uh, seven congregations, Jesus says, He who overcomes can come over and sit with me and my Father. In essence, Jesus is saying, and using this word overcome, that if you come over, if you overcome, if you don't give up, if you persevere, if you endure, if you overcome, you can come over and live with me. This is one of the grand encouragements the book has for each child of God. And here's how this is so practical. Yes, this book was written to first century Christians telling them not to give up. But friend, Christians still, still suffer today. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 says, All who live godly in Christ Jesus will face persecution, will suffer. I'm going to suffer also. And the book of Revelation tells me that if I overcome, if I never give up, if I never bow down, if I never allow my tribulation and troubles to overcome me, if I overcome them, I can come over and live with Jesus in that heavenly realm. There's a key question also in the book of Revelation. 
It occurs in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 10. Christians are suffering. Looks like at some point in time that Rome and its government is going to be ruling and reigning. It's the world power. And Christians are wondering, God, we've held true to you. We've not given up. How long are we going to have to endure this? And here's the key question. Revelation 6 and verse 10. The Bible says Christians cried out. These are the voices of the saints who've been martyred. They're uh, under the altar as it is. And they cry out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Christians want to know, God, how long is this going to happen? Aren't you going to avenge us? And here's what God does. God gives them white robes and He tells them, you just wait a little while and I'm going to seek my vengeance on the ungodly. Friend, the lesson again is so powerful. Christians are engulfed in this white robe. Their purity is known by God. And God says, you don't give up and I will repay, says the Lord. God is the one who will take care of the ungodly. And so it's an encouragement to be faithful, to not give up. Now, part of understanding the book of Revelation is to understand what some of the key ideas. It's like a, a drama, a vision unfolding on the scene. And if we're going to understand this vision, it is a vision. If we're going to understand it, we've got to understand some of the main characters, if you will, some of the main ideas that are presented. To not be familiar with that is to approach the book of Revelation in a very flippant way. What are some of the keys? We're going to offer seven. The first three in this lesson and four following in the next, which will help one approach the book of Revelation ready to understand it. What's the first key? Key number one, Revelation is written in symbols. It is a book that tells us it is symbolic, it is figurative, it is not to be taken word for word and literal. For example, notice Revelation 1 verse 1 again. Look at what the Bible itself says. The very first verse tells us this. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, notice, to show his servants, things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. The word show, the word signify, tell us that this is a book that is going to be symbolic. God is going to put before the mind of Christians certain images. Uh, for example, in the book of Revelation, you see a dragon. Think about that image. One of the most mythical beasts in all of human literature and literature in history. It could never be tamed. It wreaked havoc on the countryside. It was powerful, and it was something to be feared. That's the image of the dragon. Is it a literal dragon? No, that's not what God is trying to get across. You've got a sea beast. Oh, people who uh, lived near the ocean understood and had heard the rumors. There's this great beast in the ocean, can sink any ship. No sailor, no hunter of it could ever pierce it with a, a sword or a harpoon. That was a fearful image, the land beast. You've got these riders on horses. You've got the temple picture. All of these are images not to be taken literally, not to be picked apart, but they are to make an impression on the mind that is lasting, that has one main idea, like the dragon, a very powerful beast that is to be feared, and yet a beast that can be overcome with God's help. Now, we know that this is a symbolic book because in Revelation 1 verse 1, Jesus or God says these things were to be signified, and the word signified means to be shown by signs. God says to John, I'm going to give you this revelation and I'm going to show it to you in signs. Here's why a lot of people don't understand the book of Revelation. People come to Matthew through Jude and we read it and we take it literally and rightly so because the text demands that in most every place. But we come to the book of Revelation with that Matthew through Jude mindset where, you know, we're going to look at the book of Revelation, we're going to take it literally, and there's this literal dragon, there's this literal beast with seven heads and ten horns, and, and we get all confused in that. The book of Revelation is a different type of literature, apocalyptic language, which is a language in which God, through signs and symbols, showed His power, gave His message to Christians. In fact, Revelation itself means, is the word apocalypsis. And the word means an unveiling. God on the grand stage for Christians is going to unveil to them, 
not to the Roman world. He's going to unveil to them in this figurative language images they would understand so they could know his message. See, this type of writing, apocalyptic language, was de designed specifically to reveal God's message to some while veiling it to others. Christians would understand about the temple. They would understand about the city four square. They would understand about the 12 tribes or the 144,000. They had a clear meaning of that. But were a Roman government leader to read this, he would think it was something fancy, something interesting, but not a direct threat to the Roman government. And so it revealed the message to those who were familiar with it and hid it from others. You see, a lot of these images would be just simply reminders to those who have come out of Old Testament Israel. Much of the imagery in the book of Revelation, a lot of it anyway, takes us back to some time in the Old Testament where God's people would be familiar with that history. And again, not all of it, but a lot of it takes us back to Old Testament history and the people would surely understand that. Now, part of these symbols, part of understanding this, this first key is to understand that some of these symbols are given in numbers. Numbers have a very important place in the book of Revelation, and if we fail to understand the significance of these numbers, we're going to miss out on a lot of what Revelation is about. For example, let's take just a moment to think about some of these numbers. The number three is an important number in the book of Re Revelation. It's used several times, and throughout history, throughout Bible history, three has always represented God. Think about it. You've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the Godhead. And so three is a number which represents divine things, a number which represents God Himself, a very divine number. Then you've got a number, another number that's often used, and it's the number four. You've got four representing the earth, or things that are physical, not spiritual. You've got, think about it, the four directions, north, south, east, and west. You've got four elements that we often think about. The number four often represents things which are earthly. And then you come to another number, and that is the number seven. You have God, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, represented by three. You've got the earth, represented by the number four. You combine those, and you've got the number seven the number which is always represented perfection, seven days in a week, the seven churches he talks about in the book of Revelation. These are, are things that are complete, that have a totality. Now, after you think about the number seven being a number for perfection, think about the number six. Six is one less than seven. If seven is perfection, then six fall short of perfection. Now that's even going to help us when we come to the number 666. If 7 is perfection and 6 is one less than 7, imperfection, well, what would 666 be? Complete and utter imperfection. That's all he's trying to get across to us. The number 12 often was a number that represented humanity or, or people or the world's uh, powers uh, or the world itself. You've got the 12 tribes. Uh, you've got the 12 apostles representing humanity and people. The number 1,000 was a number that often represented an indefinite time period. Read about a thousand years, a thousand years of tribulation, or a thousand years in which Satan is going to reign. My friends, those are not literal thousand years. We need to see that as an indefinite time period, a time period which we do not know the exact date for, but a time period which will definitely come to an end and will not last forever. And so part of understanding these symbols is to understand what the numbers are all about. Now, here's the second key. First key is, Revelation is a book that is written in symbols. We are not going to approach it literally every word and pick it apart or every image and pick it apart. It's symbolic. But here's a very important key also. Key number two, Revelation is written primarily about things that would shortly take place. Friend, understanding this, I believe, will help you get a good grasp of the book of Revelation. The Bible says in Revelation 1 verse 1, notice again the emphasis here, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave Him to show His servants, things which, notice, must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. When God gave this revelation to first century Christians, it was about things that were going to happen in their lifetime. Revelation, this is where so many people go off. Revelation is not about the year 2008. 
Revelation is not about what happened during the medieval, medieval period in the 1500s. Revelation is not what's going to happen 10,000 years down the road. We need to look at the book of Revelation and understand it's written for first century Christians about things that are going to shortly take place. Revelation 1 verse 3 says, Blessed is he who reads, those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep the things in it. Notice this, for the time is near. Shortly take place, time is near. And did you know the book closes even on this same tone? I want you to see Revelation 22 verse 6. The Bible says, Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to so, show his servant Notice this, things which must shortly take place. The dragon, the sea beast, the land beast, the riders on horses, all those images, not future events for us. Things that were going to happen during the time period of these Christians who read it. Too many a people approach the book of Revelation with an eye toward the present. In reality, friends, we need to read the book of Revelation with first century glasses on. W.B. West wrote a commentary and he entitled it this, Revelation Through First Century Glasses. Friend, you'll be a big step ahead in studying the book of Revelation if you approach this book with the understanding that the things that are happening in it were happening or about to happen shortly to first century Christians. Revelation is not dealing with Hitler. It's not dealing with social security numbers. It's not dealing with Saddam Hussein or world wars. Revelation by application tells me that just like in the first century, God's going to take care of me during tribulation. His kingdom will always outrule and outreign all others. But it was written for them to help them overcome the persecution they were facing and the symbols are symbols they understood, things that happened during their lifetime. Key number three, not only is Revelation symbolic, not only was it written about things to shortly take place, Revelation was given for the purpose of comforting persecuted Christians. Now I want you to think about Revelation 1 verse 3. We've referenced this several times, but listen to it again. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep the things that are written in it. For the time is near. Bless the idea of, of comfort, help, benefit is given to the Christian who reads this, understands it, and obeys it. Think about this. Christians during the time of the Roman era, during the time of the writing of this book, were suffering greatly under the hand of the Roman rule. For example, history will record that some of these Roman rulers, whether it be Nero or whether it be Domitian, some of them were so evil and so ungodly that if you were openly caught or if they came in and found you worshiping Christ, claiming to be a Christian, they would take you from your home, drag you out in front of your family, they would kill you, they would uh, soak you in kerosene, place you on a stake in the garden of the Caesar, and light you on fire as a candle. Some were even taken from their homes, and as a type of sport, they were thrown to the lions in the arena for people to watch. That's the kind of suffering that was occurring. If you were a Christian, you weren't a halfway Christian because you knew that you might die for Christ. And so this book is written to encourage, to comfort Christians who are suffering beyond any limit of the imagination which we've suffered today. The point is this, God knows your suffering and God cares. And if you endure to the end, you'll win the battle. In Revelation 14 verse 13, I think it's one of the more encouraging verses. The Bible says, blessed are the dead who die, blessed are those who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. God says this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They can rest in their labors and their works do follow them. God knows, God cares, and even if you die, comfort is given because in God's sight you've received a great blessing. It reminds me of Romans 8 verse 18. The scripture says, Paul said, I consider that the sufferings of this present world, they're not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I believe there's a passage in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 that is a great corollary, a great commentary even, on the book of Revelation. In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, 
Paul says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to men. But God who is faithful with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This is kind of the idea of the book of Revelation. God's not going to allow you to be tempted beyond what you can endure. Here's what you need to remember. God's faithful. And just like there's temptation, God is going to make a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Christians needed to know that. That escape may have only been by means of death. But you know what? They got out of their persecution and God took care of them in the midst of that. And so as we think about these helps, as we think about these first three keys, I think these will begin to give us an understanding of what Revelation is all about. Friend, the book of Revelation, I believe, is one of the most powerful pieces of inspired writ that we have in Scripture. One will do a great value to himself to openly approach the book of Revelation with the understanding that God wants to give us. You see, the message is very clear. God loves His children so much that He will help, He will offer aid, and He knows and cares during their suffering. If anything, this, this initial lesson ought to impress on our minds how we need to be children of God so that we can receive this comfort and so that we can receive this blessing. My friend, there's nothing more important in all the world, especially in the times in which we live, where there's so much ungodliness, so much sin, and even so much persecution, although it may be in a different way, for Christians faithfully living for the Lord today. This book ought to tell us how to, we desperately need to be children of God. Friend, are you a faithful child of God? Are you a Christian? Have you ever obeyed the gospel? God's plan of salvation is very simple. One must first be willing to hear the Word of God. Having heard that Word, Romans 10 verse 17, we then must believe that Jesus is God's Son, John 8 verse 24. Once we believe in Jesus, we must confess Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. Romans 10 verse 10, Matthew 10 verses 32 and 33. We also must repent. Repentance is something that precedes confession because as Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. So having repented, I'm willing to confess the name of Jesus, and then I must be baptized in water. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. And then, once we become children of God, the blessings and the benefits are ours, and no matter what happens, no matter how hard the time gets, no matter what government we're living under, the message of Revelation is, be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. May God bless each of us as we strive to live according to the gospel of Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.